Okay, so you should be able to see my PowerPoint now, I hope. And I see a few thumbs up, so that's a good sign. Well, it's uh, very good to be here with you. Uh, just uh, thought I'd give a little brief introduction and say uh, a bit about what I do. I'm one of the senior lecturers here at North Coast College. I was a single missionary in Senegal, West Africa in uh, 1986. I was uh, eventually working amongst the Bainuk people, which is a tribal group doing uh, church planting and uh, starting to work on Bible translation a bit. A young lady who happens to be uh, on another screen here uh, caught my attention. It took me eight years to catch up with what she was thinking, but uh, we eventually got married. We have three children, and uh, I'll just uh, show you my wife here uh, just a, a little bit here. We'll bring her up, and uh, we work here at North Coates College. Uh, we're the Bible and Missionary Training Center for uh, New Tribes Mission uh, in the U.S. We're called Ethnos 360, but we sort of have different names, different uh, places around the world. But uh, our goal is to take the gospel to the least reached uh, people groups in the world. There are still at least 2,000 languages uh, with not one single scripture in them. And so we see that as our task. We've uh, raised our three children here at North Church, uh, North Coates, and uh, whilst we've been involved in the Bible and missionary training uh, program here for New Tribes Mission, and uh, our sort of goal is a thriving church for every people, and uh, that's really what we want to see. We just uh, had graduation uh, on Thursday evening, and uh, then yesterday was goodbyes, and even a few goodbyes today. What I thought is I have a little video clip here. It's some drone footage of the campus, and I might just uh, talk a little bit whilst it's uh, playing for you. It's, uh, the Lord has blessed us with 53 acres approximately of property here. You can see in the center of the screen, that's the training block with the solar panels on the roof there. And then we have four dormitories. So we're quite a large facility. Uh, we might have at any time anywhere from 60 to 80 students studying the Bible. The first year is a biblical studies. The second year is our cross-cultural evangelism course. And then the third year would be our advanced linguistics. That would be for those people that will actually be doing uh, the Bible translation and also breaking the language down. But God has given us plenty of uh, property, uh, plenty of land. To, to have things like uh, for young people, a, a full gymnasium. Uh, we have uh, a large and a small outdoor football pitch, which you can imagine. But of course, what's really at our heart is training people to take the gospel out to the least reached people groups, people that have uh, no access uh, really at all to the Bible. And so you can see just up at the top of the screen, the fourth dorm up there, we have a nursery over to the right, uh, you can see with the white roof there, and you can see the little football pitch. We have plenty of room here. Uh, the Lord has really blessed us. Uh, we've had uh, a team that works. All of us are missionaries. Uh, again, we try to keep our tuition uh, down to, to practically nothing, because really our interest is just training uh, young people to take the gospel out. And so that's what we've, uh, what we've been trying to do. And uh, just to, to show you just a little bit here, I'll just get this to move. Uh, sometimes it doesn't like to it doesn't like to help a bit. But uh, just to show, this is sort of a few pictures here of what Joanne and I are particularly involved in. Over on the left in the top is me teaching in the biblical studies. That's the first year course. And uh, this next year, we'll have right around 30 new students joining us to train in the Bible. We are, as far as I'm aware of, uh, one of a few, if not the only dispensational uh, Bible college still remaining in the United Kingdom. And uh, again, we focus, we do an intense Bible study 
on the bottom left picture is me teaching in the second year course. And uh, I don't do too much there. And of course, in the center, everyone sees what we're doing now, right? Uh, sometimes there's a bit of Zoom teaching. We had to do that through COVID and all those things. But uh, we are uh, quite a bit different than many other training facilities around the world. We're very hands-on. So we have students in our home all the time. And I like to just show a few pictures. We have students. We, we're we not just interested in lecturing. We want to get to know people and get them involved uh, in various things. And that's really what we do. So we uh, will often have students in. And uh, we certainly at least once a week, uh, if not more, uh, doing that. But just enough about North Coates College, if you have any questions at all, you're going to see across the bottom of all my slides, uh, my wife's email. My wife also happens to be my secretary. So she 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 not only loves me and keeps me in line, she also uh, helps me to be organized in the office and in the mission. And so if at any point uh, you have uh, any questions, you can email Joanne and she'll get those to me. Also, uh, being that I am a Bible teacher and uh, I, I like to give notes out, if you'd like to have a PDF copy of my, my presentation, uh, my slides, my wife will email it to you. If you, you know, if you find that as a struggle, uh, feel free uh, to, uh, e she can print them for you if that's necessary, but emailing them is much easier. Well, uh, we're going to take off here, and we're going to talk about the Bema Seat of Christ, the, the Judgment Seat of Christ. And uh, again, it's a really fantastic study. It, I, I had a real interest in doing this uh, in because I've been out at a few conferences. Uh, I get to travel around. I meet students every year. And I, I found that people really uh, seem to have some quite confusing ideas about what uh, heaven, what eternity is like, what the millennium is about, uh, how those things will will work, the different roles and responsibilities that we find uh, in the church, but also uh, in how God is going to deal during the millennial reign of Christ, and then, of course, the eternal state. And, of course, God has a plan uh, in the church today. We understand there are roles and responsibilities uh, in the church, roles and responsibilities in life. There are roles and responsibilities uh, in the home. Uh, and, and so the Bible teaches all those things, and we see that God uh, has an eternal plan. And, uh, you know, when you look at the Bible, one of the things as a Bible teacher uh, I really enjoy is talking about context. Uh, I feel today that, uh, and I, it's more than a feeling, I guess I should say, by experience of 40 years uh, in full-time ministry, uh, people, uh, we, we like to say that we all interpret the Bible literally. And, and yet what I find is uh, everyone seems to have a different definition of what it means to look at Scripture in its context, to interpret it literally, and, and God has a plan. God has a plan for the Jew. God has a plan for the Gentile. God has a plan for the church of God. Now, his plan of salvation has always been the same. It is by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ on Calvary. Uh, the gospel is very clear. He died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he arose again the third days, according to the scriptures. Uh, again, that was in the Old Testament. We see the promise of that in Genesis 3.15 uh, with uh, the one who would come and crush the head of the serpent. And, and again, a promise uh, of a good news. And, and Israel uh, had that. You see it through all the types and pictures all through the Old Testament of the ark, only one means of salvation. And uh, that was in obedience to uh, the revealed word of God. And uh, you see it also uh, in the tabernacle. Uh, again, there was only one, one entrance way. You had to go past the offering and the sacrifice and the cleansing of the labor to go into the presence of God. And those in the presence of God inside the tabernacle walked in the light. And they had the fellowship bread. 
And, and of course, the prayers of the saints, the altar of incense was right before that. Uh, we know that what happened uh, after Calvary is the veil was rent in two, that access to God uh, was no longer necessary through the priesthood, but we as believer priests have immediate access to him. And so uh, we, we want to think about what's it going to be like? Uh, what is God's plan? And I want to particularly think about how the church will be involved in eternity in God's plan. And of course, when we come to this idea of the judgment seat, the only way that we can really understand it is to recognize that words matter. When the Holy Spirit inspired the over 40 authors over 1,600 years to write 66 books of the Bible, they complement each other. They never contradict each other. Uh, the Bible is a beautiful picture of God's big plan, and God communicates, and he also communicates clearly. And so I just say that because when we come to the, the judgment seat of Christ, the, the, the word that appears in the Greek, the bima, uh, when it's used in the context of, of Romans, okay, now when I say Romans, I mean actual Roman citizens. It, it appears in, in Matthew's gospel, John's gospel, Acts. Uh, all through there. And you, when it was used by Pilate and Agrippa and Galeo and Festus and others, that was a judicial tribunal. And, and that's how the word is used in the sense uh, uh, of that, for that. Now, however, when we come to how it's used uh, it, for us in the church age, and in, uh, when we see it used, for example, in Romans uh, 1410, Romans 1410 is a verse we'll refer to quite a bit uh, this evening. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For sh we shall all stand before the judgment seat, the Bema seat of Christ. Uh, 2 uh, Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each might receive for the things done in the body according to what he has done, good or bad. And, and again, so it, it's a very clear here when we think of us as believers in the church age. Okay, again, other scriptures that, that lead into this, and again, we'll be referencing back to these along when Paul talked about the Christian life in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24 to 25, he says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run at one, but one receives the prize. Run uh, in such a way that you may obtain it. You, you see, uh, one could run and not win the prize. Uh, you see, we, we, we've already read this. We will receive a reward, uh, right? And again, but we could also lose reward. Verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 9 says, everyone who competes for the prize is self-controlled in all things, temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. Uh, Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I, I think we've, we're a collective group of people here tonight. We'll be of different age groups and, and all, and we will understand this, that uh, things change. I often say to the young men when I get to speak to them here that I recognize when I turn 20, things changed. When I turned 30, I no longer was out on the football pitch so much. When I turned 40, uh, watching football on TV, I even lost interest to it. At 50 and now in my 60s, things change. You find, uh, you know, that your, your body changes, that these kinds of things happen. But the idea of the Bema Seat to believers in the church age is about the reward. We understand uh, that we have an inheritance, as Peter said, that's incorruptible, it's undefiled, it doesn't fade away. It's reserved in heaven for us who are kept by the power of God for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last days. Uh, I have here Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. It, it, there's a warning here. Let no one cheat you of your reward. 
taking delight in false humility, worship of angels, intruding into those things which we have not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Uh, you see, again, uh, we, we want to be careful. We, we want to walk in such a way as to win the prize. Uh, again, we understand that the prize is not necessarily gauged on amount. It's not what well done, thou good and uh, profitable servant. It's well done, thou good and faithful servant. You see, the Lord judges, as we know, not by sight of eye, but with righteous judgment. Even Abraham understood that the judge of the earth would do what is right. And, and we understand, as Hebrews teaches us, he is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, that, that nothing is hidden from him, that, that God understands why we did something, how we did something, what our heart was. And again, I think we'd all say that sometimes, you know, in, in, the, in our Christian faith, we've perhaps said something or done something that, that uh, you know, we, we thought, oh, I, I wish I hadn't have done that. Uh, but we, we recognize that maybe our motives in the time weren't bad. And, and again, we were just trying to be a blessing, but perhaps we could have done it better or differently. But, but again, you see, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, it is about walking according to the Spirit. So the, the Bema Seat in our context tonight is not, uh, not a judicial judgment because Christ took our sin upon himself. You see, there remaineth therefore no more sacrifice for sin. Uh, again, part of the difficulties when you look at people who hold to mid-trib, Pre, so-called pre-Roth, uh, post-trib views, is I believe they don't understand that Christ paid for our sin full stop. And, and again, we'll never be judged again for our sin. He placed his righteousness on our account. However, th there is a reward, and, and we want to, to be careful that we run our race in such a way to win the prize. There are, as we know, a number of crowns uh, spoken about in Scripture. So the, the first question is, uh, as we come to this, we're going to answer the who. Well, I, I believe that the Bema Seat is about believers, church-age believers, those that are saved. The church has a timing. It began at Pentecost, okay, with the uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit promised by the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples, John 14, John 16. Uh, that, that's very clear. The, 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 uh, the church age, the mystery doctrine of the New Testament will end with the harpazo, uh, with the rapture of Christ. And again, people hold uh, different views on that. I'm going to touch on that just a little bit as we go along here. But Romans uh, chapter 14, I just want to read a few verses here. I'm going to start in verse 9. I only have verse 10 uh, on the screen, but verse 9 says this, For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to me. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Uh, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. This really becomes, in this context, very interesting. In the early church, you would have had a lot of converted Jews, those that would have been under the, the law of Moses, that which Christ, uh, those things which were against us, he nailed to a cross, putting an end to them. And, and again, they would have been under that, and they would have been under the eating restrictions. Uh, I, I personally believe, I, 
Not my intention to offend anyone uh, here tonight. I, I, a lot of people on, thank the Lord for that. If you have any questions, you feel free to write and ask me, but I'm very concerned today as I have met those that are, are with what's called the Hebrew Roots Movement. Uh, these are people that are trying to place themselves, again, under the law, under the eating uh, requirements, under keeping the festivals and, and those things. And even as we read in Timothy, uh, those that seem to be looking into uh, things like genealogies and, and those kinds of things and are very enamored uh, by those kinds of things. Listen, uh, as believers in Christ, we should be focused on our Savior and focused on getting the gospel out. And, and we want to be very careful because we shall all stand before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And, and is each one of us will give an account. Now, I get the privilege here at North Coates College of, of teaching um teaching 1 Corinthians. Uh, I also teach uh, a, a little bit on uh, what we call disputable matters. Uh, and I'm, I'm very convinced from Scripture that we are called to judge sin. Okay, there was a sexual immoral situation at Corinth, and the church was allowing that to continue on, and that was sinful. The law taught it, but even before the law, it was sinful uh, that sexual immorality was allowed within the church, and and we're we're called to judge what is clear sin. What we're not to judge is people's motives. And, and again, this is what he's addressing here. And again, we're to give people time to grow and to learn. And, uh, you know, we talk about things like disputable issues and uh, is it okay to eat pork? Is it is it not okay? What would you do? Is it okay? What, you know, uh, to do this, to not do this? Listen, we need to be careful that if someone's doing something that is sinful, we should uh, try to help them. Uh, Galatians 6 tells us, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of humility, right? We, we want to talk to people. Uh, is, is, are you okay? What's going on? Why, why, are, why is this happening? Do you understand what the Bible says about this? And, and again, we understand that each one of us We'll stand before Christ. Now, we're going to talk about the when in a few minutes, but, but that is something that is very clear. Now, 1 Corinthians teaches us really clearly that there are three types of people in the world today. Now, now look, I, I'm, I'm talking about what's in 1 Corinthians. I, I recognize, okay, we could talk about personality types. I don't mean genders. There's two genders. Uh, okay, there's male and female. I'm not talking about that. But, but there's three kinds of people. Let me show you what 1 Corinthians says. It talks about the natural man. Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, but the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually uh, discerned. Again, he's using the Greek word sukikos. That, that's an unsaved man. Uh, again, I've I've had this where I've I've taught in the past, and I've had people say to me, "I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. I'm completely lost." And when pastor talks, I don't get it. And this, the the first thing we should say to someone that I say to I tell the students this, you know, when you meet someone and they says, "I just can't, I can't get anything," is you say to them, "Let me ask you, what's your testimony?" And you're expecting. To hear them say, well, you know, when someone shared the gospel with me and uh, I, I was under conviction, I understood I was a sinner and that Christ died in my place. And then, bing, there you go. They're a believer. But, you know, if they say, well, I've, I've done this. I've had people say to me, do you see that church there? My grandfather set the cornerstone. Uh, my grandmother, uh, that's her pew. Right. And and again, I have a Bible that was written in 1611. You know, I've had people say anything, but I understood I was a sinner and I'm saved by grace. And, and again, you can have all kinds of knowledge, but if you don't know the gospel and haven't come to a personal understanding of a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're lost. And that's a natural man. Now, that's that's one individual Corinthians talks about. 
The second individual is the Numa Takos uh, guy. Numa is the spirit, right? It's from the spirit, okay? And, and this is a believer, okay? Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Again, the spiritual man is an individual uh, that has the Spirit of God and is walking in the light, is is not living in sin. He's, he's uh, not letting sin, as Romans says, reign in his mortal body, that he should obey its lust thereof. As it says in Romans 6, do we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says, God forbid. However, uh, it is possible. It is possible as a Christian uh, to sin. And, and again, uh, that addresses uh, person number two, three, sorry. Uh, that is the carnal man. Uh, the carnal man is the sarkikos, sarxes of the flesh right, is the Greek word there. This is the individual that is a believer. Uh, but you know what? Uh, they are like babies. And, and again, he addresses here, let me just read uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 1 to 4. He says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual pneumatakos, right, but as to carnal, right, sarkikos, fleshly, as to babies in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you are not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal, sarkikos. You're fleshly. For where there's envy, strife, and division amongst you, are you not carnal and behaving like, he goes back to the first man, natural men. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? You see, Paul fed them. He lived with them for 18 months, and he, he, he fed them biblical teaching, biblical truth. But you know what they did? They drank milk. Now, it's very unnatural. Again, I, I do this with the students, and I get a big laugh out of them. I say to you, it'd be very unnatural if we as adults were still drinking mummy's milk right? But again, I can tell you by experience that I've met Christians who've been Christians for many years who never read their Bible. They never personally grow. They're not walking in the light. As a matter of fact, they're acting like he said here, little children. They're selfish. They only want what they want. We don't stop and bathe things uh, in the church with prayer, you know, so that we understand what would you do. And and again, we, we hold these uh, really prideful ideals, you know. And of course, their attitude uh, is, their actions is they were acting like unsaved. They're proud. That's the problem at at, at Corinth, uh, you know, I find this, you know, people like, oh, I know Dr. So-and-so or uh, Pastor this or uh, this this believer here. You know, I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Peter, Cephas. I am of Christ. I've had people say that to me. And yet, you know what? Uh, they're, they're about a, a centimeter thick in, in, in depth, right? And because they really are more uh, interested and more like Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees, like the chief seats, they they made long prayers, right? So to impress people. They wore the proper clothing. They they wore long robes. They they had special greetings and, and these kinds of things to be seen of men. But but Christ called them vipers and whitewashed sepulchers. You you see, uh, these were now these were people that had a form of godliness but denied the power thereof. You see, they, they didn't actually know Christ as the Savior. When the very Savior, the Messiah, spoken of in the Old Testament was in their midst, they didn't even recognize him. And that is very sad. Uh, Paul wanted something different. We find this uh, in Hebrews, right? In Hebrews, the same language is there. In Hebrews 5, verse 12 to 14. For though by this time... You ought to be teachers. Now, now look, the author of Hebrews is wanting to teach them about Melchizedek, wanting to go into some real depth. But he says of them, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. 
and have come to need milk, mummy's milk, right? And not solid food, not meat. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That's the Greek word, mature, teleos. That is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You, you see, again, he's using the terminology of 1 Corinthians 9 and, and Timothy uh, uh, of the exercise. You see, studying the scriptures, reading the scriptures, uh, applying the scriptures to our life. You see, there are those that study the scriptures. James gives a warning that we should not be hearers of the word only, but doers also. You see, when we're in fellowship in a local church, a local assembly, and we're listening to the word of God, we should be asking ourselves, how can I apply this to my life? What what can I, what's what's the truth here that, that I can live by? You know, uh, we might be thinking of how can I show love to others? How can I reach the lost? How can I share the gospel? Uh, God is not willing, Timothy says, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And 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 so we see here that there are two believers here. There's a spiritual man who, in very simple terms, is someone walking with God, walking in the truth, and, and being used of God to, uh, to encourage, to comfort, to exhort others, it is an encouragement. I've often said it uh, in, in every church I've ever been to. There's uh, the fellow there in 3 John, Diotrephes, that had to be in first place. He loved the preeminence. He, he, he had to... He had to always have it his way, and I, I and I'm not just saying it's men either. It can be it can be brothers or sisters, you know. And I, I put it this way: in First Corinthians, we have the gifts of the Spirit, but then there's also the gift of discouragement. Uh, that one doesn't come from God, but but we often find that that others are tearing down. You know, that's the carnal man. That, that's the man, the fleshly man, the man that, that that has to be seen, has to be heard, has to have everyone come to his opinion or her opinion. And again, uh, there's no reward, and Corinthians is going to bring that out for us. Now, I, I know that we, we've we looked at this, but we're just going to talk a little bit about the what for a second here uh, as we build on our, our thinking here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, it says this, I'm going to start in verse 6, 2 Corinthians 5, as we think about the what's going to happen, okay? This is going to tie in to the who in a second here. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. You, you see, we, we don't get a cloud uh, you know, we don't have a cloud that we follow. We're walking by faith, dependent upon God. And then verse 8 says this, For we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. You, you see, Paul expected eminency. He expected that the Lord could come back at any time or or he might go to be with the Lord. Because he says in verse 10, we've read it before, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each might receive a reward uh, for the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And he says this, verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and also, I trust, are well known in your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves against you, but we give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. Uh, again, Paul, uh, they attacked him. There were those that said, Paul, he talks real big in his letters, but when he comes, we'll, we'll see what he's like. But Paul's testimony, his faithfulness to God, spoke for itself. And he he understood that while we are in this body, 
This tent, he has said earlier in chapter 4 and chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, right? Uh, we're absent from the Lord, and right now we're walking by faith. Our, our trust is in God day by day, and, and we want to be well-pleasing to the Lord. And this is it. That's how the Lord is going to reward us. Uh, for you see that he he says we can receive the things done in the body according to what has been done, whether good or bad. Absolutely, we cannot lose our salvation. Our salvation is not based on works, right? It is based on the finished work of Christ. However, if we are not walking with God, you, you see, if we're not walking with him, and Paul is going to address this when we look at the next uh, the next set of verses here, he's going to address this. There are some who are saved, yet so as by fire. And it's interesting. The reason that this has really struck me is uh, because uh, I had some individuals that were communicating with me, two or three different people. Oh, won't it be great to be with the Lord? And people have, I believe, sorry, I mean no offense, not trying to offend anyone. Oh, won't it be great to play nine holes with all our Christian friends in heaven or, or, or these kinds of things? And that is not uh, what heaven is about, right? Not about uh, that, you know, and the, these kinds of things. But we understand that the Lord is going to reward us for our walking with him, for being a spiritual man or woman. In 1 Corinthians, we read uh, the first part of chapter 3. When we look at chapter 3 uh, from verse, uh, I'll just start verse 8. Uh, and this is what Paul says, and then we'll get to 10 on the screen here. But 1 Corinthians 3, verse 8 says, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and, and one will receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. Now, here's Paul speaking as an apostle, right? I laid the foundation and another builds on it. Now, look, the, the context here is what was happening in Corinth. Remember, Paul and Priscilla and Aquila from Ephesus, uh, right, uh, sent Apollos to Corinth, a, a, a good teacher of the scriptures. And Apollos went, and, and Paul used himself in Apollos because he says, we're co-workers, we're co-laborers, we're workers together. They weren't working against each other, they were working together. So this is the illustration he's using here. And, and this is what he says, right? As a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another builds on it. But he does say this, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, but then he goes, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test each one's work of what sort it was. If anyone's work, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Of course they knew. Uh, this is Paul's sarcasm. He uses it in Romans and Corinthians many times. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will. Now, I have to say my version of the Bible, forgive me for saying this, isn't consistent because the Greek word for defile is the same word that I'm, I'm using the New King James. It says, him will God destroy. However, the word is the same Greek word defile. He's not addressing loss of salvation. He's addressing loss of reward. The work is defiled. You see, gold, silver, precious stones put on fire become more pure. Wood, hay, or straw 
You see, wood, hay, or straw is a carnal man's work. When they're placed to the fire, uh, you, you see, I say this of the students, our students get the privilege of what we call the practical program. Uh, they each get opportunities three afternoons a week to do something practical, to help keep the fees down. Cleaning toilets is, is number one on everyone's list. And I say this, you know what? Two people can clean toilets. And the, the one person can clean the toilets and they can shine and sparkle. But if their heart is wrong, if they're doing it not with eye service as men pleaser, but as servants of God doing the will of God from the heart, there's no reward for, for cleaning. But if their heart is right, they're serving God in whatever they're doing. This is in your church. This is in your home. This is in your work. You see, we don't do things with eye service and men pleasers, but as servants of God, doing the will of God from our hearts. And he's addressing here a loss of reward. And he's addressing, we're the temple of God. And, and he says, don't be deceived, right? Uh, he tells them here, uh, this is the problem, you see. We want to be not deceived. We want to understand that at the judgment seat of Christ, the illustration is used of fire, that, that the things which we have done will be placed under a, a, a judgment fire, and, and gold, silver, precious stones last for eternity. But wood, hay, and straw, poof, is gone. No eternal reward. And, and you see, he's addressed that there are those that are saved, yet so as by fire. I spoke to someone not too long ago, and I said, uh, I'm really sorry. I think you have a, a misunderstanding here. It isn't just that we're all going to be floating around in heaven and, you know, doing whatever we want. We're there to worship and to praise. And, and again, Revelation makes it clear that we will serve, even in eternity. It uses the same word, we'll serve the Lord in his eternal kingdom. We'll serve the Lord. We're going to look at that in a few minutes in, on the earthly kingdom. But only those who have been faithful, only those uh, who have been spiritual, who have walked with the Lord. You see, uh, there are those who are saved, yet so as, by fire. Uh, John, the Apostle John in John's epistles, he put it this way. He said, uh, but the anointing, right, the anointing uh, which you have received from him abides in you. Now, in, in 1 John chapter 2, at the beginning, he's made it very clear, the anointing we have is the promise of the indwelling Holy Spirit given to every believer at salvation. Every one of us at salvation receives the Spirit of God, and we can either walk under the control of the Spirit, or as it warns us in two different passages, we can quench the Spirit of God, right? Uh, we can quench the Spirit of God, and, and, and again, we can quell what He's trying to do, and we uh, are, or we can walk in the control of the Spirit of God. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is excess, but be fulfilled with the Spirit. Allow the Spirit. You'll never get any more of the Spirit. Uh, again, nowhere in Scripture does it teach that. I, I don't mean to offend anyone, uh, but that's that's what the Bible teaches. We have the Spirit of God, but do we walk as a spiritual man under the control of the Spirit of God, or are we carnal and are we quenching the Spirit? You see, uh, we, that's the issue. Paul says this again, but the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. You don't need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. You see, walk in the spirit, and now little children abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence. Some English translations say boldness uh, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. I wish I had the time to go into this in depth. The Greek language uses the present tense. Everyone who's born of God is, is doing righteously. It is walking continually in the spirit. Now, look, he says here that when he appears, 
We can have confidence or we can be ashamed. You see, if we're carnal and if we're just walking in our own means, if we're we're not uh, fellowshipping with other believers, we're not encouraging, we're not, uh, as we are able to be involved uh, in the Lord's work, praying and giving and, and, and lifting others up uh, in, in, uh, in the Spirit and, and helping them, listen, it, we could be ashamed when he appears. You see, we, we come to the when, okay? We, we've done the who and the, the what, uh, but the when, in the scriptures, there are two resurrections. Again, this uh, preterism, amillennialism, uh, the, the, the kingdom now sort of teaching, uh, believes uh, either that A, everything is done and we're in the kingdom now, or B, there's still a little bit to come, uh, maybe resurrections. Uh, and, and they look at scriptures and they don't understand them in their context. But, but just to give you a little bit of an idea, in the Bible, there's a teaching, there's two resurrections. You see, the first resurrection is the resurrection of the just, the resurrection of believers. It's called the first resurrection in Revelation chapter 20. We'll read that again, but there's also a resurrection of unbelievers, and that resurrection takes them to uh, Gehenna, to the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. Of course, the question is, uh, which resurrection uh, do we want to be in? And I've set two markers here. We understand Calvary. And again, I'm not going to go into great depth here. And we understand there's eternity, the eternal state. But sort of in between, we would understand. I'm going to show you the verses in a second. What's a part of the first resurrection is Christ himself. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says that the Lord Jesus Christ was the first fruits of the resurrection. Uh, he's the prototype. He, he, he won uh, the, the victory over sin, over death, over the grave. And, and we understand that, that Pentecost happened. And when Pentecost happened, right, the church began. The church began uh, in Acts chapter 2. And again, I, this is, I really wrestled. I thought about changing this picture because as we all know, the church is not a building. The church is the believers. And this is one of the problems that we have with people who hold either the mid-trib view, the post-trib view, or the so-called pre-Roth view. They don't understand that the church is about believers, and they think uh, that there are others in the church that aren't true believers, or they have no assurance of their salvation, or they think people can lose their salvation, which is really uh, then not believing that the work of Christ was complete at Calvary. And uh, But that's a, different, uh, that's a different message altogether. The church age is going to end. Okay, the mystery teaching of the New Testament, the body of Christ. And, and God is going to turn his attention to Daniel chapter 9, to finishing the, the covenantal promises in Abraham. The Mosaic covenant was fulfilled by Christ, but there's yet to be the Davidic, the, the land's covenant, and the new covenant. You see, uh, we fall, I believe, under the, the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant, that in you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. But Israel hasn't looked on him yet in whom they have pierced. They will one day. And, and Israel has lands and leaders and laws. And that's what they're looking forward to, having their land, having their leaders, a, a ruler from the loins of David that sits on David's throne in Jerusalem, and, and of course, having the law in their hearts and, and knowing it, the promises of the new covenant. But but we, uh, we fall into the benefits of that. And again, the church is not destined to any of God's wrath. And I, I'm not going to start talking about uh, wrath and misunderstandings of verses, but the tribulation comes. In the middle of the tribulation, there's two witnesses that have been witnessing from the beginning of the tribulation to the middle of the tribulation. The Antichrist is going to put them to death. Uh, he's going to overpower them. They're going to be doing signs and wonders uh, and, and all sorts, and, and they're going to die and lay in Jerusalem. Uh, revelation 
uh, chapter uh, 11 brings this out very clearly. And, and again, uh, they are going to be resurrected after three and a half days and ascend up into heaven. Still yellow, you see my picture scheme. But at the end of the tribulation, uh, there are verses, I believe, clearly that teach that the tribulation martyrs, those that have gone through the tribulation, become believers uh, and uh, have remained faithful to God, not taken the mark of the beast from the middle of the tribulation onward. Uh, they'll be resurrected, but also Old Testament believers. You see, God has a has a plan. The plan of salvation has always been in, in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But God's plan for the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God is different. And, and the, the first resurrection is marked out differently. Now, I'll show you the verses in a second. I want to just say at the end of the thousand years is the, the end or the resurrection of the unjust or to damnation, as it states in one passage. It's the great white throne. We are going through the Bema Seat. Let me just, here's, a, here's on my picture here. The Bema Seat of Christ is going to happen, I believe, in conjunction with the resurrection. You, you see, because uh, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The church will be raptured before the tribulation. Now, look, I could go on for days on that one. Uh, we understand at the end of the tribulation, in Revelation uh, chapter 19, uh, we understand, I think I'm unmuted there, Brother David. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb uh, is at the, the Revelation 19 is as Christ is going to return. Now, look, the, the tribulation martyrs, the Old Testament believers, there are those that are attendees at the marriage supper of the Lamb that takes place there. And then we see the church coming to the earth because they're stated as having fine linen, clean and bright which are the righteous acts of the saints. Revelation 19, verse 6. That's the church in their resurrected garments. And again, I'll say a bit more about that. Let me just show you the verses here. Uh, I'm going to just put them all down here. And uh, so you can have a, have a little look at it. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 and 5 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, and had not worshipped the beast nor his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads and on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until uh, the years uh, were finished, a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. It, you see, it, it's very clear in 1 Corinthians uh, that Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 20, 23, it says, But afterwards, those who are Christ at his appearing. That's the parousia. You, you see, uh, the, the, the church is going to be raptured, I believe, as what will commence the coming of Christ. You see, the coming of Christ is both over a period of time, seven years, but it's finalized in him actually coming to the earth. You see, it's with pomp and circumstance. It, it is him uh, judging the nation of Israel, finishing uh, what Daniel chapter 9 states. And, and again, judging those the Gentile nations. You see, the times of the Gentiles, we're told, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. But as we've looked at the scriptures, uh, we know very well, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, those that are the dead in Christ, which will be raised first, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the clouds to be with the Lord forever. You, you see, I, I believe it's at that point that the church, uh, that the church is is uh, raptured, harpazoed, and, and then goes through the bema seat. We're rewarded at the end of the tribulation. The church, 
after the marriage supper of the Lamb will come down in the middle of the tribulation. There are these two witnesses that were dead, and everyone had parties, right? They'll be resurrected, okay? And then at the end, again, Daniel is very clear. Uh, Daniel chapter uh, 12 talks about uh, the beginning. It says, at that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and he shall. Uh, there shall be a time of trouble. This is the great tribulation. This is the last three and a half years of the tribulation, okay? Such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people will be delivered. Each one who is found written in the book, many who sleep uh, in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. But the promise is Daniel 12, 13. Uh, Daniel is told, but you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of these days. You see, Daniel said, look, because the church, God's got a distinct plan to prepare her to rule and reign with him in his kingdom. But, but the Old Testament believers, Isaiah had the same promise in Isaiah 26. Your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise, awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew of the tribes, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter your chambers, shut your doors. Behold, you hide, hide yourself, as it were, for the moment, until the indignation is past. For behold, behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and to those who disclose her blood, and no more cover their slain. In that day, the Lord will send his severe sword great and strong, and will punish Leviathan, the fleeing servant, okay? And, and again, I, I believe Isaiah had the same promise that after the day of the Lord, that part of judgment, uh, he would arise. And, and again, right, uh, the, 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 the timing of this uh, to me is uh, tagmati is the Greek word that's used uh, in 1 Corinthians. There's an order to resurrections. The Christ is the first fruits 2,000 years ago, then the church, then the two witnesses, then the tribulation martyrs, along with uh, the Old Testament, both Jew and Gentile believers will be resurrected. That is the first resurrection. Unbelievers, which is not what we're here to talk about, they will go to the Megas Lucas Thronus, the great white throne. That is called the second death. And, and I'm not really going to talk about that for time. That's not what we're here about. But uh, we want to just uh, sort of finish up with why. Okay, well, the who, the what, uh, or the who, the what, the when, and the, the why. Well, uh, the Bema Sea. Uh, Revelation 19, 6 to 9 says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of a mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Okay, this is this is at the end of the bowls, okay? Uh, this is at the end of, uh, of, of Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon, as we see happening on the earth. The Lord omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed is those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true sayings of God. You, you see, again, we have a promise of, of reigning with Christ. In, in Revelation 5, before the tribulation begins, in Revelation 5, verse 9 and 10, it says, they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, 
you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation, and hath made us a kingdom of priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. You see, I, I believe he's speaking to the church. 2 Timothy uh, chapter uh, 2 and verse 10 to 13 says, Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying, if we died with him, we should can also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. I do not believe, again, this speaks of loss of salvation, but loss of reward. You see, as a believer, as a blood-bought, reconciled, forgiven believer in Christ, I want to walk with him. You, you see, uh, Ephesians 2.10 says, we are a workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. That's addressed to the church. It's addressed to the mystery teaching of the New Testament from Pentecost to the Harpazo, that we would walk with God. Listen, we, 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 we just need to walk with him, to not sin, to not let sin reign in our bodies, to be faithful. And then we recognize that God as the righteous judge, that the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ will look at our lives and he will say, well done. And we will wear fine linen, clean and bright, which are the righteous acts of the saints. Think of eternity. Think of the the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, luminescent streets, gold that's see-through, the walls of different types of uh, jewels and foundation stones, and, and, and all this, that, that there's no need for the sun, the moon, or the stars, but the Lamb is its light, right? And, and we will reflect the glory of God through eternity as we have simply walked in love, walked in purity, walked in wisdom, uh, walked in the truth, abided in Christ, lived in fellowship, uh, sought to be a blessing, sought to be an encouragement, and, and, and to, to trust in the Lord and to grow. Study, it says, to show yourself to prove unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing, the word of truth. And uh, again, I know that's a lot. Uh, and uh, again, I remind you that uh, there's our, our email addresses. Uh, if you have questions and you want to you wanna address my wife or you want the notes, uh, Joanne would be happy, happy to, to send those with no questions asked. We won't send you anything else. It's just just send you the notes or you write questions. And I trust it's been an encouragement uh, to you this evening. Uh, I, I've, uh, if I'm wrong, feel free to, to come back to me and, uh, and we can chat about it and find the Lord's wisdom in that. I think it's iron that sharpens iron and uh, we want to learn and, and be taught by these things. I'll just, as David asked, we'll just close in a word of prayer and ask that God would encourage each of our hearts today. Lord, thank you for uh, this time together tonight. Thank you for the living word of God that lives and abides with us forever. Thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit that you gave us at salvation. May we not quench the spirit of God, but may we walk with the spirit of God, Lord. May we uh, be, be used of him uh, and uh, preaching the gospel, uh, sharing the word, encouraging other believers, praying for them, uh, upholding them, uh, and, and loving arms, Lord. And, and yet, uh, we just know that it gets so easy to trust in our own strength and, and to not be a spiritual man, but to be carnal. Thank you for the truth of Scripture, Lord. Uh, thank you for what you've done. We say, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Maranatha, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.